Um, well, hello and welcome to today's Toolbox Peer Networking Session. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that despite us meeting remotely today, many of us are currently residing on unceded ancestral lands of the Duwamish people, both past and present. We want to acknowledge their historical connection to this land, um, as well as the efforts by our governments to make us forget their enduring presence and their story. Um, just want to thank you for that. Um, today, we have a, a fantastic program um, centered around the Healthy Business Streets Guide. It will be facilitated by Brock Howell, who's the lead author of the report, um, as well as helped by Richard Gelb from Seattle King County Public Health. Um, we're going to talk about, excuse me, we're going to talk about the efforts to open streets and public spaces for dining and recreation, um, and really hear about how that's working broadly in the cities of both Puyallup and Seattle as well as more localized efforts in the Ballard neighborhood of Seattle. Um, following these presentations, we're going to break into small groups to discuss the successes and challenges of these innovative efforts to aid economic and public health recovery. Before I hand it off to Brock to introduce the Healthy Business Streets Guide, just want to go over a couple of ground rules for today. Uh, first, as uh, this Power, this slide says right here, please sign your name in the chat box if you have not done so already. Um, this is important if you hope to obtain your AICP credits for today. Uh, second, please just ensure your mic is muted during the presentations to uh, minimize any disruptions. Third, uh, we will have time for questions after each panel presentation. Um, if you wish to ask a question, please uh, use the chat box to type your question or indicate that you would like to ask it uh, in person and staff will monitor and relay your questions to the panelists. Um, that's all I have. So I will now pass it over to Brock to introduce the Healthy Business Streets Guide. Thank you. Right. Um, well, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. My name is Brock Howell. Uh, I've been fortunate to be able to work with Richard Gelb of uh, King County, uh, sorry, Public Health Seattle King County um, with their Environmental Health Division uh, on this project, as well as others on this team. Um, I think Leah might be on the, on the call here as well. Um, I, and <laughs> Richard, um, as I present the, the introduction of the guide, please feel free to jump in uh, to uh, share your perspective on it as well. I am really excited about this discussion today because of the opportunity to have um, both the, have the Seattle Department of Transportation who has done a really a remarkable job in transforming our, our streets, um, the Ballard Alliance on, uh, on this webinar, um, to, to cover a real life example uh, with Ballard Ave, um, and then the city of Puyallup, um, which provides context outside of the city of Seattle. Uh, and there's many, many cities across the state that are doing great work on this front. Um, so with that, I'm gonna kick off. Um, so uh, late spring, we started a discussion uh, with public health about uh, providing guidance of how to remake our streets uh, in light of the pandemic to make sure that um, people were able to keep their physical distance in public space, as well as to aid with economic recovery, especially for small and local businesses. Um, so ultimately we published a guide um, at midsummer. Um, that's published by uh, Public Health, Seattle and King County, and the State Department of Health, and is currently endorsed by the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department and SDOT, um, and has been reviewed by a number of agencies and organizations, and this is a partial list on the right here. Um, we do have a edition 2.0 that is working its way through the Public Health Agency and Department of Health Agency uh, process, and we look forward to uh, releasing that soon. Um, all of the con almost all of the content here today is from the, the new edition, which is kind of a, an update of the first edition. 
So our first guide, it looks like the one on the left, that's the covers, the orange one. You, some of you probably have seen it already. It's available on King County's website. Um, and it was in large part based off of um, the National Association of City Transportation Officials Guide of Streets for Pandemic Response and Recovery, which uh, it has been updated on an ongoing basis, uh, which is the approach we have wanted to take as well with our guide. Like I said, there's many cities across the state that are doing great work to think about reprioritizing the right of way for uh, either active transportation or outdoor dining and merchandising displays. Um, these are the ones that uh, I've been able to track down uh, of who's been uh, leading the way on this work. Um, so everywhere from my hometown of Prosser in central Washington, small town of 7,000 people uh, and like um, in White Swan, I think I have a misspelling there, um, uh, to, to obviously larger cities like Seattle. The objectives were number one, uh, protect public health. Number two, promote the use of outdoor spaces for local small business functions. And number three, shape business districts as uh, destinations for safe and healthy activities. Our principles in uh, setting the guide is one, to center the interests and priorities and perspectives of people, businesses, and communities most impacted by COVID-19. I think we are all aware that people of color have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, currently, the Hispanic population in our state is being especially hard hit. Um, and then, you know, a lot of those folks are also working in our restaurants and are being impacted or the restaurants are, are owned uh, by people of color. Um, and we need to make sure that uh, they are able to recover coming out of this pandemic and being able to get through it. Second principle is through environmental design enable people to adhere to public health guidance. Um, it is most sidewalks uh, are six feet or less in width. That makes it very difficult to stay six feet away from anybody uh, on the sidewalk as you pass them. And so a big part of being able to reprioritize our public right away is uh, redesigning the space that allows people to adhere to that public health guidance. Number three, support local small business recovery. Uh, obviously there's restrictions on the number of people that can be inside uh, the, the restaurants and other businesses. And we need ways that they can continue to operate. And a big part of that is having outdoor spaces converted. Um, and then fourth, uh, it, we need to recognize that <laughs> this, um, that the, while in typically in planning, you know, we like to have a lot of uh, time to prepare and get everything just right. Um, but the pandemic uh, didn't have that process. That, that's not the process of the pandemic. It happened right away. And so our response also has to be very quick. So we need to protect now, uh, but we also need to recognize that uh, we need to adapt and iterate over time based off of what we're learning um, about how certain, uh, certain configurations work um, and as the public health guidance changes as well. So be able to protect now and iterate over time. The guide and, uh, uh, Oh, yep. Uh, just to chime in to say that um, part of that last ambition is what um, the second half of this session is about. When we hear from y'all to get your guidance on uh, what is coming up that future versions of this guidance should help address. Thank you, Richard. Perfect. Um, and then the, the guide also outlines a five-step uh, uh, process for how to develop, it, how to develop uh, open streets um, programs and uh, specific, uh, if you're a business, how you might go about thinking about your own particular space. So this is a generalized model for um, making sure that we are being inclusive uh, in our approach and thinking through all the, the factors that need to go into the design of a program or a specific project. Uh, so first is being able to discover and listen, being able to understand what's there on the ground. Number two, plan design modifications uh, based off of what you know from that, uh, uh, what's on the ground. Uh, formalize the roles and responsibilities of the agencies. If you're a business district, 
this is really key to be able to know uh, operationally who's going to be responsible for cleaning up, for uh, putting out the tables, taking the tables back in, those sorts of things, um, and then prepare and implement uh, the, the project, and then ongoing oper operate, monitor, adapt. Built into this are the four previous principles, um, centering community, making sure that uh, you are listening to all people, uh, being making sure that you're prioritizing people of color in the process, um, and then being sure you're iterating and adapting as you go. And so this isn't a, a you get done at step five and you're done, you're always going back to uh, step one and iterating as you go. With that, I want to jump into kind of the heart here of uh, the guide, which is um, the designs. Um, so first is uh, visual, visually the sidewalk constraints that exist today. Um, it, this is a graphic from uh, SDOT's uh, Streets Illustrated Guide, uh, which just helps us clarify terminology of the right of way. Uh, the most important piece here is the pedestrian clear zone, uh, which is the the, the space on the sidewalk where people walk, right? That's the dedicated area where people walk. And generally that's six to eight feet wide um, and needs to be clear of obstructions. Uh, so that way people with wheelchairs or who are visually impaired can safely be able to navigate that uh, right of way. Um, of course, it is often constrained um, where it's difficult to, to keep that physical distance, which is the challenge. Uh, even at an eight foot or 10 foot space, you're gonna have the uh, difficulty in keeping your space from other people. And so through environmental design, we may need to think about how to modify the actual street as opposed to the sidewalk space. Uh, there's also, you gotta think about other obstructions that may exist in the right of way and how you might manage those, like even the kiosks that you know we are encouraging through merchandising displays here in the city of Seattle. Um, or the A-frames that uh, often should be going in the furniture zone, but we also, also sometimes need that furniture zone in order to be able to walk and get around people to maintain six feet. So some of these things are also constraining the ability for people to, to maintain their physical distance. So with that, uh, our guide lays out uh, four principal ideas. And these, for those on the call here, these are not gonna be revolutionary, but uh, we do help spell out a, a lot of the different factors that you should be considering when implementing these. And we hope that the guide and the visuals are a way to spark uh, local jurisdictions interest in being able to uh, permit and program uh, these uses. Um, the first is the sidewalk extension. Um, this is a real simple concept. This is uh, really strictly from the perspective of public health, where you have a constrained sidewalk uh, there's really a lot of, maybe a lot of pedestrian activity on the sidewalk within the business district and not enough space for people to be able to safely get around each other. And an easy way of, uh, of fixing this situation is removing the curbside parking and, and uh, using some sort of delineator to be able to block that off from cars to park there and allow people to walk in it. Uh, so there's a very simple thing. Um, there's only a handful of examples of this that have happened uh, across the state, um, but is it a really important strategy we should continue to uh, look at uh, and see where it can be implemented. The next is a slow street. This is also almost strictly a public health uh, perspective when it comes to a business district which is, uh, again, sidewalks are constrained. Um, you need space for people. And maybe there's a consideration from the business district and businesses in the area that they still need local access of uh, pick up and drop off. Um, or they have some customers uh, that still need to come in, or maybe there's a high uh, uh, population of people with disabilities and they need curbside drop off, or there's a couple of businesses with uh, pick up, take out out of a business window of where they're using like Uber Eats or something or Grubhub and they need that delivery. Well, then a shared street might work a little bit better uh, with local access. And so you, it's calmed enough so both cars and people can intermix within the street. Um, is it, so uh, where we see this 
most frequently across the state isn't actually in business districts. It's uh, residential streets. And many cities across the state have implemented uh, healthy streets programs, as they call them. Um, or in Seattle, we have a secondary program called Keep It Moving Streets that are attached to parks. And uh, this, uh, so we don't necessarily see these as much within business districts. Uh, there are a couple of examples that are combined with um, outdoor dining experiences that uh, kind of add this to the, to the mixture, um, but not really exclusively. So it's, it's a thing in the toolbox we should continue, consider uh, at all times. Um, and then curbside dining. Uh, this is the one that I think we all have recognized as, uh, as important and uh, lots of cities have implemented. Um, there's lots of ways of doing it. And this is why I have here illustrated many different layouts and perspectives of how to put it in the street. Um, in the middle of, the, of this illustration on the uh, upper side of the street, you can see there's uh, uh, a, uh, a more traditional streetery of where the, uh, the curbside dining area has a full deck that is at curbside level. So people who use wheelchairs uh, don't have to navigate the curb. Um, and that's traditional. That's many cities have already been permitting these. And uh, so those were in place prior to the pandemic. And really is what uh, across the country uh, when we were thinking about outdoor dining was the inspiration for um, permitting more outdoor dining. Uh, what we have seen is uh, since then is low cost ways of implementing them without necessarily building full decks. Although some cities do require full decks or other ADA access into the area. Um, and then having fencing that is appropriate to the street or some sort of barricade that's appropriate to the street. So here, illustrated different alternatives. Um, we have seen cities uh, establish different requirements of what they think is appropriate um, to be able to have the divider line between car traffic and uh, the dining area. Um, we do not take a particular position in terms of uh, traffic management uh, in the guide. Um, that is a determination that needs to be made by the local transportation uh, uh, department. So uh, we illustrate different ways of doing it. One thing that I would note is if you do have uh, a dining that is separated from that there's a you know a four inch curb dividing the dining area and the sidewalk, um, the guide definitely encourages the placement of uh, dining that's on the sidewalk so that way somebody will sure can use it um, or making sure that there's space within the restaurant itself for that to happen. Um, we need to make sure all people can enjoy this experience. Ultimately, the responsibility for ADA requirements rests with the, with the business itself. And so they're the ones that uh, are required to, to comply with the law. Um, and then finally is creating plazas or market streets of having uh, an open space of uh, closing the street to car traffic, opening it up to people uh, who are walking and dining or possibly shopping for other things. And so in this illustration, we're making it clear that folks could have their tents and the tables for merchandising, similar to a farmer's market, and then have tables as well out for outdoor dining. There are you know, two approaches to, towards the dining experience. Um, one is to have a shared dining experience of where anybody can, uh, any, no matter uh, which restaurant a customer goes to, they can go to a central place and, and experience that dining area. Or as often as with the uh, curbside dining areas that are, uh, it could be attached to a specific restaurant. Um, this is really dependent, uh, like which approach a city takes or a district takes really depends on who is setting it up, uh, right? Um, and so there, it, there's lots of things to consider there and, and during the breakouts, maybe we can talk about that more. 
Finally, um, we do not take a one size fits all approach at all to the guide. You know, what works for a city, for business district, for a particular street is gonna be different uh, in all circumstances. It needs to reflect local conditions. And you could combine all of the different examples that we highlighted uh, into the same street potentially. And so this illustration shows uh, some of that of where you still have one, you've taken a two lane street, converted to a one lane street, uh, and tried to maintain some parking on the street, did a sidewalk extension, have both individual dining and shared dining, and even converted a private parking lot in the middle of the street to shared dining as well. Um, and I think, and there's also merchandising displays. So the more that we do this, the more I think we'll get into these alternative designs uh, as a community. Uh, so, you know, being, the, there's not a one-size-fits approach, and um, I think there's a lot of flexibility that we can use to get here. The report does go into several considerations to highlight um, that go beyond just illustrating the potential layouts. Um, I'm going to go briefly through these, and then uh, we'll discuss them a little bit more within our breakouts. Um, so there are considerations such as maintaining a 20-foot uh, fire lane on the street. Um, generally. Uh, so each fire department will make its own determination what is appropriate for fire lanes and setbacks and those sorts of requirements. Um, here in the city of Seattle, uh, you can't have major structures within that 20 foot uh, area, but you could have uh, things that could be easily moved out of the way, like uh, small tables um, or cones. Uh, so those, you know, what is appropriate for each community is going to be dependent on your local um, guidance from other agencies. Um, then uh, a couple other things. Uh, the top illustration there is guidance around uh, universal design and ADA requirements of uh, what I already previously discussed uh, about uh, sidewalk dining versus at level, uh, having an at level uh, outdoor dining space. Um, this should also be a direct connection from the doorway of the, of the restaurant into the, the if it's going to be a private uh, outdoor dining area, there should be a direct route from the front door into that space. Uh, the illustration on the right um, provides guidance on takeout windows for making sure that uh, if there's going to be a line, a queue line for takeout windows, so that there should be markers on the ground to help encourage people to maintain six feet while there's while they're standing. Bottom left guidance. Uh, again, on deliveries and um, recognizing that it, having delivery zones is an important aspect for small business recovery. Um, guidance on similar to queue lines of lines at bus stops, that's on the left, on the right. Uh, guidance on uh, if, if there's going to be a, a plaza uh, type street closure or opening, um, that we may want to add additional bike parking to that space so there's additional capacity to, so people can uh, come to the street, uh, park a bike on the ends of, of the plaza, as opposed to bringing the bikes to the middle of the space, taking up space there, and making it harder for people to walk around in the middle of the block. In addition, we should just be encouraging in this time where we need physical distancing to encourage people to go by bike. Uh, as opposed to um, be carpooling with unknown people, perhaps, or uh, as an alternative to, to riding transit. So other considerations which don't uh, have nice illustrations include uh, kind of reiterating um, guidance that, that exists already for restaurants and dining, including sanitation, food handling, employee safety and health. Uh, recommendations to, to really reduce permit reviews and costs, uh, thinking through ways to, to minimize the cost of insurance, uh, recognizing iterations for change of use during the day or week, priority, and then again, reiterating priority businesses and, and communities of making sure that as city agencies, we prioritize uh, outreach and capacity building within communities that have been most impacted. Um, so a, a minority owned restaurant, for example, may not have uh, a lot of experience working with the city uh, 
especially when it comes to street use. And so we may need additional outreach to making sure that they know the possibilities and have the capacity to work through the city agency's processes. Um, finally, um, addition 2.0 uh, will include uh, some guidance around weather. Um, I, <laughs> We, we know that uh, the rain and the cold is going to impact the ability for people, for restaurants to, to have people dining outdoors. And so we've already seen, you know, new tents go up with sidewalls, uh, uh, attempts to have heaters inside. Um, so we are following in terms of this guide, what the city of Seattle is doing in terms of uh, encouraging the use of electric heaters instead of gas heaters. Um, we're still uh, navigating guidance around how many walls are appropriate around the outdoor space, uh, given public health guidance. Uh, 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 the more contained the space is, the you know the the higher the viral the potential viral load could be if somebody is COVID positive, and so we have to think about airflow considerations at, as those walls get contained. Um, and so this is definitely on our discussion for later today in the breakouts. Um, how am I doing for time, Ben? Uh, we're just a little bit over, but I think we are, are fine. We can um, bleed into some of the breakout, perhaps, or just go over a little bit. Um, okay, I'm going to quickly go through some example photos, and then I'll, I'll hand it over and go to the panel, uh, which is, I think, where I'm most excited for the discussion to go towards. Um, so, as I mentioned at the top of this, uh, there's many cities that are doing great work. So I just want to highlight some of them so you can see, visually see them, and that might spark our conversation uh, as we have group discussions, have a little bit uh, a better idea of what's happening. Um, obviously, some of these photos are from a few months ago, so it looks all uh, sunny in some of these as opposed to uh, our degree uh, weather for today. So that was Bothell and they closed, they did a street closure. Uh, some of these also have closed up for the season. So I should just flag that uh, potentially. Edmonds also had uh, had street closures um, to, for outdoor dining. Um, so you can see this. This is also Edmonds. More Edmonds, they had, out, uh, they, uh, they started with that outdoor but with the street closures, but they started to implement um, individual restaurant dining as well. Kirkland, um, I this is a highlight of uh, of a you know just a private dining space. I think it might be shared by uh, two adjoining restaurants, um, but they early on of their process uh, were focused on outdoor lighting and ADA ramps, uh, something that Kirkland required. Uh, Kirkland's Park Lane, uh, just on the other side of the, uh, the block from the other photos, um, that has done uh, evening street closures. Uh, it's a lunar designed street, so it's curbless. And as a result, uh, instead of having um, the, the frontages along the buildings open for as a sidewalk when the street and it is changes to this plaza style. The, the pedestrian walking in the middle of the street and the dining is right up against the, the restaurants. So that's a, a nice feature that's possible when there's no curves. Um, Issaquah uh, did street closures. Um, Port Townsend had a great program, uh, still has a great program. Uh, Redmond uh, exped created a street read program on the fly. Um, and this is the first photo of that. Even Langley out in Kitsap, or sorry, Island, Kits, Island County uh, had a great program. You can see they actually went in with event fencing. Uh, they, the city uh, contracted for a bunch of event fencing that they made available uh, for businesses to use. Um, Ballard, which we'll see, um, there's a few more photos here, so um, you just get an experience uh, of those. 
I can also just say for the record that we will be posting these presentations online afterwards. So um, you can peruse on your own convenience. Um, Melrose Avenue on Capitol Hill, um, Crockett Street um, had a street, still has street closure on Capitol Hill. Queen Anne Hill, I mean, I see it said Capitol Hill, but Queen Anne. It's Capitol Hill. Um, the, the previous 11th Avenue was more of a shared dining experience. This is a specific uh, experience just for Optimism Brewing on the adjacent building. Um, Columbia City did a, uh, has a street closure. Uh, it's a mix of both uh, of where there's this outdoor dining, but there's also this uh, travel lane on the right side of the outdoor dining area. And obviously that allows for some car traffic to get through, but it's closed technically. So um, it is, a, this is an example of where it's a mixture of both uh, out, like a shared outdoor dining space and a, and a um, uh, the whole street closure just for the purpose of walking, right? So uh, Pike Place Market has had this, I think, Somebody could could tell me if, if it's gone now. I saw a recent photo where it was no longer up, but had it for a bit. This might be my favorite uh, on Ninth Avenue in South Lake Union, middle of the street, open dining, kept the bike lanes open for uh, bike traffic to get through the street. A couple more from Capitol Hill. Sumner. Uh, the city, I believe, helped pay for this outdoor dining spot. Tacoma, um, they, it's a, I don't believe this is full time. Um, and then Walla Walla, uh, which is beautiful. They just started this early in the summer. Um, really great. A few other highlights to examples is, uh, you know, having dining on the sidewalk as possible when the sidewalk is really wide uh, on 2nd Avenue in Seattle and uh, Belltown. The uh, Jupiter uh, has had outdoor dining and they expanded it during the pandemic. Um, curbside market examples of not just outdoor dining. Uh, a number of restaurants or other businesses have used private parking lots to be converted. Um, my local dive bar converted their side parking lot, uh, which was on a hill into an outdoor dining space. And you can see that on the bottom right there, Lenny's. Um, and they actually built new decking all the way through it. Uh, so that way is tiered because it was on that hillside. Um, and then this is not just for uh, places with, you know, street with regular um, business districts, even more suburban style shopping centers can get in on the action. Uh, this happens to be the U Village, uh, so it is in Seattle, but any shopping center could, could do this um, as well. And I think ultimately, one of the things we're interested in is how to make them permanent. And uh, certainly we've seen examples of that in the past. Uh, and the upper, upper right there is Winslow in, on Bainbridge, which has converted you know, a space in their town from a street into outdoor uh, dining. And then Port Towns on the bottom left, who has done that as well. And in, you know, in Seattle, you have examples like Occidental Plaza, uh, Westlake uh, Plaza, and you know, places like that. So with that, uh, I am excited to hand this over to the panel. Um, before I do that, Richard, do you want to add anything? Well, just to notice that um, Brock shared a few examples of uh, where municipalities have provided support for this kind of activity. Uh, they may have a, a city uh, administrator or a mayor or council folks that are eager for this. and. Uh, just to acknowledge that um, one of the kind of um, ambitions for this session is to better understand um, municipal proactivity. 
and what are the foundational steps that uh, we who work in the public sector can take to foster this kind of activity that supports our private and civic sector um, actors that we're seeking to support during these challenging times. And so um, just wanna kind of encourage us all to be thinking about um, you know, where can we uh, shoulder contributions to this happening from the various perches we sit in and that we can cultivate a shared sense of the uh, underpinnings that uh, foster uh, more progress here. Fantastic. Um, with that, I would like to introduce our panel. Uh, we have Devin Reynolds of the Ballard Alliance, uh, I believe Katie Baker and Meredith Neal of the city of Puyallup, and um, where's Casey Rogers, and Elise Nelson of the Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, we are gonna start with Devin uh, and then go to the city of Puyallup and then SDOT uh, for our presentation. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Devin and I believe you have a slide deck to pull up on the screen. I do, thank you, Brock. Let me go ahead and get that set up here. All right. Uh, yeah, first off, Brock, thanks for the presentation. That was really cool. I actually want to go back and look at some of those precedents because uh, there's some really cool stuff out there and you've got some really good photos that captured a lot of really innovative things that um, I think you could all take note on. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm, good morning, everybody. I'm Devin Reynolds with the Ballard Alliance. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of walk you through a little bit about what we did, um, steps we took early on, and then how, what those steps led to. Um, and uh, yeah, so without that, I'll go ahead and keep going. I'm gonna skip through um, this first slide here, which is just an agenda, uh, and take you right here to uh, this precedent document. In fact, actually, is this uh, like facial bar blocking view for anybody? I can I see the slide deck pretty well, but if you wanted to put it in the presentation mode, we might, it might take up the full screen. All right, let's see here. Presentation mode. Any tips on that? On the PowerPoint. Right, yes. If you go, the, on... if you go on the bottom right of the, oh, very close, the that icon, right? The, the far right one. Awesome. The... There you go. Cool, thanks. All right. Well, so first off, um, as many of you in your cities and neighborhoods, um, you know, experienced early on in COVID, uh, a lot of our businesses were closed and depending on what phase we were at at that time, uh, there was limited capacity for restaurants and retailers to actually operate. So, um, you know, in, in early June, we started looking around the country at, at different cities to see what they were doing because we realized that the, uh, in Ballard, a lot of, especially in Ballard Avenue, a lot of the, the, the uh, restaurants and retail are small and just couldn't really accommodate any kind of percentage of like 25% in restaurants, you know, 30% in retail. That just wasn't something that was very feasible, especially for restaurants. Um, so they all had to adapt to just do takeout food, even if they didn't offer it before, that's all they were able to offer now. And then uh, retailers were basically just doing online um, retail only. So we started looking at other cities around the country to see what they were doing uh, in early June. And a couple that, that popped out or three that popped out to us was Tampa, Florida. Uh, you'll see the photo, uh, and they actually, the photos correspond with the cities of Tampa is on the upper right, Portland is on the middle, and then Cincinnati, Ohio is on the bottom right. Uh, Tampa did some really cool stuff. They fully, they were one of the first ones I saw that fully closed down a road uh, in, 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 uh, in their city. They also provided uh, Jersey barriers and picnic tables for those uh, neighborhoods that were closing those streets down. Uh, Portland uh, were turning their parking lanes into street cafes and plazas. They were streamlining the permit, which was really important, we thought. And they also provided each business that wanted to apply for a street cafe or plaza permit a toolkit, uh, basically of what, what is permissible for you to utilize in this space. Cincinnati, Ohio, they waived permit fees and provided Jersey barriers as well uh, to help make these things happen. So on June 16th, the Ballard Alliance, we put together a six page precedent document and provided it to our city council member, uh, the mayor's office and uh, our representatives at FSTOT to help encourage the city to move in this direction and to hopefully provide them with a roadmap of, of, uh, of ways they can move forward with that. 
Um, on June 26th, which is also uh, the same day that SDOT announced uh, the street cafe and outdoor merchandise display permits, we went ahead and put together a, uh, or sent out a 15 page survey to businesses on Ballard Avenue to try to get a uh, temperature on what they uh, thought about the permits and possible street closures. Some of the questions we asked uh, were, you know, do you plan to apply for this permit? Uh, would you support a street closure? Uh, would you be willing to reroute deliveries around the street closure? And then how concerned are you with uh, regards to parking lots? We had 24 businesses respond to this survey. Uh, overwhelmingly, it, the businesses were very excited about any of these options because basically the, the sense was that this is such an unprecedented time. We're going to throw spaghetti at the wall and see what, it, what sticks. Just, just do it. Just do anything you want to. We're, we're willing to try anything. Um, but there were some concerns. So uh, there were concerns around deliveries and the loss of parking. That was something that we definitely noted. Uh, and then in our early research, we obviously were realizing that the footprint we wanted to utilize incorporated uh, or e each, of, each of the two blocks we wanted to, to work with had mid-block private parking access that had to be accommodated. So whether we want the street closure or not, those were concerns we had to actually take uh, in mind uh, and figure out how to actually problem solve for. Uh, so the same day that we released that survey, SDOT uh, put out the application for the street uh, cafe and outdoor merchandise displays. Uh, Ballard was one of the, uh, <laughs> I think Ballard put forth some of the most numerous uh, number of applications in the first week. Um, we did a lot of work to try to help prepare some of these businesses to get ready to apply. Uh, I will say Casey Rogers on this call, uh, very, very helpful with us connecting businesses directly to him uh, to help kind of handhold through the process. So that was very helpful. I think that really helped field a lot of applications from our neighborhood. Um, we saw an immediate benefit, especially for the restaurant uh, community, because as I mentioned before, they weren't even open for indoor dining at all. Even though they were allowed to do 25%, they just weren't doing it. It didn't pencil out. Um, they were, a lot of them weren't even open, even for takeout, because they just weren't set up for it. So this immediately um, gave them the opportunity to start seating people for, quote unquote, indoor dining outside. So it was really, really helpful for them. The retailers uh, didn't take as much advantage of it as we thought they would. Um, the, the, talking with a lot of them, what we realized was that they have the online presence already. 30% uh, 30, 30 capacity for indoor shopping wasn't an issue for them. Uh, they generally didn't have more than 30% capacity at any given time anyway. So they were less interested in taking, um, taking out a permit for an outdoor merchandise display. Plus they were the ones who were most concerned about the loss of parking. So um, they didn't want to set up. They wanted to keep the parking space in front of their business. And so that's generally what they chose. We had three retailers that actually did apply for it though and still are operating their outdoor merchandise display today. But there were some immediate issues that arose. Uh, for, most notably on Sunday, we had the Ballard Farmer's Market on Ballard Avenue. Um, and the businesses that had the permits to be set up in the street either were unaware or unwilling to move their setups on Sunday to accommodate the farmer's market, which had a pre-existing permit to operate in that space. So what we found were businesses were still set up on the roadway with their outdoor merchandise displays and their street cafes during the market. And the market had to figure out how to operate around that. Uh, it was very contentious and, and, and it went, uh, you know, there was, there was about two months of time where we had to do a lot of uh, problem solving around that. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the ways that helped us get to a problem solving was uh, the announcement by Mayor Durkin on July 22nd that uh, SDOT would be opening permits on the 29th uh, for full street closures. So this is one thing that we, we really wanted to kind of explore a, a potential workaround to help make the market and the restaurants happy. Um, but we already knew we weren't going to do a full street closure. That was something that was evident because uh, of, of concerns from some of the businesses with regards to the inability to reroute deliveries um, of merchandise, furniture for like, you know, furniture stores um, and, and just businesses inability to actually reroute third party delivering agencies. Um, that was one issue we knew we couldn't solve for. And then secondly to the mid block private parking access. We we're a small nonprofit you know, business improvement district, we have three employees, there was no way we were going to be able to staff uh, a street closure to allow for 
24 hour access to the private parking mid block or for delivery. So that was something we, we weren't, we knew we were not going to do a full street closure. It just wasn't in the cards for us. Um, so what we started looking at was a kind of like a grand compromise to try to do somewhat of a street closure that would benefit the businesses who didn't want to pull up stakes on Sunday for the market, but also to help benefit the market on Sunday. Uh, we got uh, to working with Elise Nelson, Casey Rogers, Amy Wynn with SDOT uh, to figure out how we could do a street closure without really closing the street. So what we came up, came up with was converting Ballard Avenue to one way traffic. It had, it's always been two way. We converted it to, we decided to convert it to one way traffic and it's important for this. Uh, I'll, get to, I'll get to why that's important uh, in just a second, but the carrot on the stick for the businesses that had permits for their outdoor displays uh, to move on Sundays was to allow them to expand from a depth of seven feet from the curb line out into the street, which is what was permissible via the uh, SDOT guidelines for those permits to 12 feet of depth from the curb line into the street. So Ballard Avenue is, a, is approximately 45 feet wide. Um, so if businesses on each side of the street took 12 feet of depth, there'd still be 21 feet of, uh, of uh, fire lane left for folks, for the fire department to work with. So that'd be right down the middle. Uh, so that was the carrot to, to, you know, as long as uh, we could get businesses to agree and sign on that they would pull up stakes on Sunday to allow the farmer's market to operate in their traditional footprint, this is what we we're going to do. So uh, SDOT was really great to work with. They agreed to allow us to do this type of road closure where we converted uh, Ballard Avenue to one way. Uh, we did that for safety reasons. We wanted to make sure the traffic was slower. We wanted to make sure traffic was predictable that it was coming from one direction only uh, because those footprints of those street cafes and outdoor merchandise displays were so much deeper now. We wanted to make sure that it was as safe to operate motor vehicles in that roadway as possible. Uh, so we converted it to one way. Um, and uh, yeah, so far I'd say that the, um, it's, it's been really, really, really successful. The businesses have really liked it. Uh, the market is operating as it normally had been, which is great. Uh, I think that made everybody really happy as well. Um, we did learn some lessons, though. Uh, so on uh, September 1st, we implemented this plan. And so we were out, uh, all three of us staffers were out there um, putting these signs in place, um, you know, out, uh, helping to redirect traffic and do an education cam cam campaign on the ground then uh, in real time. Uh, we learned that overnight that our gates walked away. Uh, so we had signs go missing. Uh, we were able to track them down the next day, but we realized that we needed to like chain them down. So we went and got 16 cinder blocks and heavy gauge chain and we chained those signs down in place on the street to make sure they were not gonna walk away or be wind blown out of place as well. Um, we worked with SPD and parking enforcement to uh, encourage them to do a um, an education campaign where they went out and just warned, put warnings on cars that were parked incorrectly. We also had to uh, update the street signage twice because we actually had non-compliance from drivers for, for a while where they were seeing the signs or maybe just not looking and actively driving the wrong direction. So we had to update the signage twice on the, uh, the road signs uh, to try to get a better, clearer message out there that this is one way. Um, we worked at SDOT, uh, Elise Nelson in particular, to uh, connect with Google Maps and Waze and Apple uh, Maps to try to update them uh, so they would not route drivers southbound on Ballard Avenue anymore. So if you typed in, I'm going to Bastille, oh, that's a bad example today. Uh, but if you were going to Bastille at the time, um, it would not route you southbound on Ballard Avenue anymore. Uh, and then looking forward, and this is interesting because uh, th this slide made sense, I think, uh, maybe Wednesday. Uh, but today, I know that uh, there are new, there's new announcements from SDOT. I'm really looking forward to hearing from them later on this call. But looking forward, we're trying to figure out how do we, how do we winterize these? Uh, these are really uh, crucial to the businesses on Ballard Avenue right now. And I know that across the city in general, too. This is basically the only way restaurants are making money. Um, and so how do we incorporate you know, sides for the tents and how many of those, how do we incorporate heating so we can keep going through the winter in this, in this fashion and also lighting as, as you know, pretty soon we all know that uh, at 4 p.m. it's going to be pitch black. So how do we, how do we light these so that people can be out there uh, as late in the night as uh, permissible? Um, and so we're working with SDOT and uh, to try to help convey what these businesses are, are wanting and, and honestly what some of them are already doing now um, as 
potential good examples. So with that, I say thank you. Uh, it's been uh, a really cool uh, learning lesson. It's been extremely creative and extremely collaborative across uh, the city and neighborhoods. Um, and I also hope, as do a lot of these businesses, that these become permanent as well, too. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, um, ben, do you want us to do Q, uh, at, take questions after each, or should we go through each panelist and then do Q&A afterwards? Yeah, I want to just take a moment and uh, pause and see if anyone does have any questions uh, for Devin before we move on. If not, um, if you have a question later, uh, it's more than OK as well. Seeing none yet, um, maybe we should just move on, um, especially considering we're a little bit behind on time. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Katie and Meredith. Um, I can only see so many names on my screen at one time, and I don't see your name. So, I, oh, there you are. There's at least there's both of you. Great. Yep, we're both up. <laughs> well, so uh, I'm excited to learn more about what has happened in the city of Puyallup and learn and hear your lessons learned. So, talk to you. All right, thank you. I will go ahead and get started. There we go. All right, um, I'm Katie Baker. I'm with the planning manager with the city of Puyallup. And today, um, Meredith Neal, our economic development manager and I will be sharing our experience um, with kind of two different but um, related street use pilot programs in the city of Puyallup. Um, so in 2019, city uh, council established a food truck pilot program. Um, there was limited success with that initially. And early in 2020, we um, kind of relaunched um, a more streamlined version of that pilot program, hoping for greater success um, this spring and summer. So then COVID-19 pandemic um, changed everything and the uh, reopening restrictions required us to kind of think bigger um, and establish a full outdoor dining and retail use pilot program. Um, as we've all experienced and heard stories today, um, the pandemic had unprecedented economic impacts on all types of businesses. Um, so in June of this year, recognizing that reopening restrictions would continue to impact our restaurant and retail businesses, the Puyallup City Council was presented with a variety of options um, and allowances, understanding that retail and uh, restaurants could reopen um, at limited capacity and social distancing measures. Um, that vehicle traffic and parking use had decreased as a result of the pandemic and um, businesses needed various options to serve their customers through expanded use of the public right-of-way and on-site parking adjacent to restaurants um, and retail businesses. So when thinking about a framework, staff saw this as being a natural companion piece to the recently updated food truck pilot program with the focus here being on supporting brick and mortar businesses with options to access the right of way for space to serve customers in a safe and healthy manner and following all health protocols. We presented council with a slate of options for open air commerce that utilized those public spaces, um, including parking spaces, um, both parking lots as well as on street parking um, that had been experiencing kind of a decrease in vehicle traffic and parking usage. Um, this is an opportunity to um, join other cities in our region um, that you've heard about today in thinking outside the box to support businesses during this unprecedented time. We proposed it as a pilot uh, outdoor dining and retail program to be established administratively. Um, that kept it more simple to administer, um, faster turnarounds for our permit process, and greater flexibility as we were um, able to be more responsive to business needs and changing um, health guidance. We originally anticipated this program would operate through October 31st of this year, 2020, um, but due to the continued necessity of businesses to take advantage of these options, it's been extended to October 31st, 2021. Um, and throughout the development of this pilot program and these various options, um, it really has been a coordinated effort between 
the Development and Permitting Services Department, Economic Development, and Public Works um, to really team up and um, develop these options and help businesses implement them. Um, so we'll, Meredith and I will be walking through the various options today. Um, the first, as I mentioned, is a food truck pilot program. This was originally established in 2020, but had been um, revised and streamlined in early, um, I'm sorry, established in 2019, but revised in 2020. Um, it resulted in our permits being um, issued much more quickly. We were issuing them generally in one to two days if um, we had all the proper information provided. Um, we issued 10 food truck permits just within the span of the first um, couple of months. And they can operate in virtually any on-street parking location throughout the city. Um, the original version of the program was focused on our downtown area, um, but even before the pandemic, we had heard requests from food truck operators that they wanted to be able to operate anywhere in the city. Um, so as long as there's a safe parking location for them to do so, their permit does authorize that. The biggest hurdle with this has been for the food trucks to provide the proper insurance endorsement to the city um, that, um, that covers their operation within the right of way. If they're operating on private property, they don't um, need to name the city as an insured, but for a right of way operation, they do. Um, and that's been the biggest challenge that we've had with, um, with these operators. Um, in terms of some changes that we've seen and how they operate since uh, COVID, they, we've seen them locate in different um, areas of the city. So when these businesses or the food trucks were initially um, permitted in 2019, the few that we were seeing operate at that time were mostly in um, business areas um, with a lot of um, you know, foot traffic during the day. And we saw that shift pretty quickly to residential neighborhoods, um, particularly neighborhoods with homeowners associations. They were, um, as well as apartment complexes, were organizing food trucks to come um, since everyone is working from home. Um, so we've really seen you know, those businesses be able to respond quickly and fluidly um, to these changes as well. We have not received much community feedback on the food truck pilot program, even though it's been in place for um, about a year and a half now. Um, in my planning world, no news is good news um, when it comes to that type of thing. Um, if people aren't calling us with complaints, um, then generally it's we can assume it's fairly positively received. Um, and then in addition to the food trucks that operate um, throughout the city um, and can move around, there is also the Washington State Food Truck Association um, established a food truck Fridays program which um, has been very successful. It's a weekly event um, at a consistent location in our downtown area near City Hall. And each Friday at lunchtime, there's a different truck um, parked there. And so people um, have come to know that, you know, there will be some food truck there as an option um, each week. And that's been, again, really popular. And they've extended um, what they initially proposed have extended the length of that program. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Meredith to walk through the other components of outdoor dining and retail. Great. Thank you, Katie. So, um, so the city formed an economic recovery team when COVID started to identify ways to help businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. When we asked how best to support our locally owned restaurants and retail shops, we heard loud and clear that they needed new options for ways to operate. So in June 2020, the Puyallup City Council approved the creation of a pilot program to support brick and mortar businesses with options to access the right of way for a space to serve customers in a safe and healthy manner. And they also opted to waive permit fees on all of the pilot programs. So here are a number of the options and I'm gonna walk through each of them that the council approved and that we tested out this summer. Next slide. So the first one is sidewalk dining and retail. Um, so al fresco dining and open air shopping offers the community a way to enjoy the outdoors while supporting local businesses. And what it also did is really provided the space needed for establishments to enact social distancing while having feasible occupancy levels and being able to serve enough customers. Having people on the street also brought a sign of much needed vitality to our city's shopping and dining district and created conditions that serve to rebuild patronage. 
So one of the really interesting things is that nobody actually applied for that program, but we saw it happening quite a bit in our neighborhood. Um, and if you go back real quickly, um, what you'll see is in a couple of the slides that we had a lot of pop-up shops that started happening where a number of our neighborhood coffee shops um, started bringing in vendors. And so you'll see a couple of examples of that both at our Anthem Coffee in downtown Puyallup and also at Elements Coffee where they routinely have um, other types of vendors who are doing pop-ups and they found that they have customers for both. The other one is that we've seen a lot more sidewalk dining um, and while technically we wanted people to apply for that, um, we've had a no enforcement decision that we're just letting them, if they put tables out and if we still have at least four feet of clear sidewalk space for pedestrians and ADA, that we're gonna let that go ahead and happen. And so we've seen that popping up a lot around our downtown core. Next slide. So parking lot dining. Um, in Puyallup, we have two regional growth centers, our historic downtown, which has a more urban form, and our South Hill area, which has the regional mall and more suburban form stores. Since no option is a one size fits all approach, we wanted to generate options for businesses with parking lots out front for parking lot dining. So interestingly, it had never occurred to us that the one business that might apply for this was a bowling alley. Um, but as you think about it, bowling was not allowed. It was shut down entirely until mid-September when the governor allowed some small level of um, bowling league training activity. So um, Daffodil Bowl, one of our local bowling alleys, had to rely entirely on their restaurant sales. So Daffodil Bowl was the one business that applied for this permit. Um, they... The business next door to them had a whole bunch of these ecology blocks. And so they filled up about half of their... Um, parking lot area directly out front and created a large outdoor dining space and then wrapped it with, uh, they painted the ecology blocks. But interestingly, they reported that once they got that up and running, that they had a 25% increase in restaurant business as soon as the outdoor patio opened and it kept on going up from there. So for them, it was definitely a, a boon for their business. And I think it also attracted more people there and made them think about the dining option at a bowling alley as an option. So next slide. Uh, so the next one is parklets. So many of our restaurants in downtown are small and with the reduced occupancy, they were only able to have a few tables indoors. But our sidewalks downtown aren't particularly wide. So we had a fair amount of limitations in our sidewalk dining options and spacing. So the best option was to use parking areas with streetery style parklets. So back in June, we created the program that allowed businesses to do that. However, we didn't have any takers throughout the summer. So in August, the city of Sumner um, built some parklets and distributed them to businesses downtown and we decided to follow their lead. So first I wanna give a huge shout out to uh, Ryan Windish, the city of Sumner's community development director who I believe is also on this call who um, shared all of their plans with us, their experiences with building it. And we jumped in and our city facilities and road crews, they welded the frames, they cut and stained the Ipe wood and they installed the parklets. Um, we ended up in total building four parklets which each measure about 16 feet by seven feet. And we reached out to all of our downtown restaurants and asked them if they were interested. We had about 10 restaurants who expressed interest in hosting them and we selected four sites for this fall. The plan had been that we were gonna pick them up for the winter and store them and uh, redistribute them next spring. However, we've heard from two of them that they'd like to keep them through the winter. And so two of the parklets, um, the businesses have already put up tents over the top of them. They're working on getting awnings around them. We're trying to figure out heat inside of them that also works with our fire department. Um, <laughs> we've had a few issues where our fire marshal has not been in total agreement with our local businesses for how they're heating and covering their spaces. <laughs> so um, I think that's a challenge that we're all working on is how do we extend this through the season? And the other interesting thing to note is that um, the two other businesses, the two other restaurants who have them, who do not want to keep them over the winter, we've had exercise studios in our downtown core ask if they could use them during the winter months. 
Um, we have a number of gyms that are fairly small in our downtown core. And right now, I believe it's 300 square feet per customer. And so a lot of them can only have two or three people inside at a time. And so they're looking for additional space so that they can still run classes and have a few people outdoors and kind of cycle them through. So we're working on figuring out um, things like, you know, will these be able to support kettlebells being dropped on them? Probably not. Um, but so we're starting to look at that for how we can protect them, but also let some of our other types of uh, storefronts use them during the winter months. Next slide. And then the last of the four options was temporary street and alley enclosures. So one of the big goals of this was to have a bunch of different types of options for open air commerce that would utilize public spaces. And so streets seem like a natural fit for that. And we had seen a number of other jurisdictions as, as other people have shown photos using their streets for that. There was some level of animosity from our downtown businesses about the idea of closing a street. We ended up partnering with the Puyallup Main Street Association, which is our downtown association, um, to create an outdoor dining extension program. And so each Friday night in uh, July and in August, we close down one city block that is right off of our Meridian, our main street that runs through downtown. And it, we had, it started with five picnic tables with a couple of flowers and some other things, and it kept on evolving. Um, we were trying to figure out ways to draw people down there without making it an event. Uh, <laughs> I, I sat through a lot of phone calls with our health department where they were like, oh, that sounds like an event. And we're like, no, no, it's not an event. It's an outdoor dining extension. Um, but at, at the end of the day, it was utilized, but not super popular. And while that made our emergency management person happy <laughs> that it wasn't heavily utilized, uh, it felt like it wasn't a big success. Uh, I think for me, one of the biggest lessons learned is that to be successful, you really need ownership from not only some sort of organization that's going to handle the programming of it, but that you also need or ownership from some of the local businesses. The most interesting thing to me was that uh, this particular block has a lot of storefronts, very small retail, and all of them except for one decided to close early each Friday instead of staying open late for all of the people who were wandering around to check out and see what was going on, they closed early. <laughs> so they didn't actually capture any of that additional foot traffic during that time. And they didn't really add to the energy in that space. The other thing is that um, while a few of the restaurants, the restaurants did have a bit of a bump in sales, um, but it just never really took off. We had pop-up vendors, a night market style small night market with about 10 vendors for the last couple of weeks. And that still didn't, it didn't really attract as many people as we had hoped it might. So now I'm gonna pass it back to Katie to wrap up. Yeah, so um, you've heard Meredith speak to some of the lessons learned here. And um, I think we do share a lot of the experience that we already heard from Devin and Ballard. Um, but in general, you know, kind of our primary take home points through this experience was just to think outside the box. Um, there were some things proposed that, you know, made our traffic engineer uncomfortable, um, were challenging for public works to implement, um, you know, made our permitting team have to jump up and try something new. Um, and I think everyone um, just came to the table with an open mind and got on board quickly. Um, you know, we addressed issues where we needed to. Um, but it was really an opportunity to do something different. Um, another take home point is just to keep the process as simple as possible. Um, this is both for the benefit of the businesses that want to take advantage of these things, as well as for staff. When you're trying something new and outside the, the typical process, um, it really needs to be as simple and streamlined as possible. Um, you know, we're all under a lot of stress right now and doing things differently than we did a year ago. Um, so keeping it simple helps everyone to implement it and um, just have a consistent message for the business community. 
Um, and I think the other thing to note is just that a streamlined process and these innovative options, it might not be enough for businesses to actually take advantage of these things. Um, you heard Meredith speak to um, the fact that the city needed to step up and, and go build some parklets to be able to give to these businesses to take advantage of them. Um, you know, our restaurants, our retail establishments, they're already stretched um, beyond belief right now. And so while they may want these options, um, they probably don't have the time and energy and capacity um, to actually go out and construct something themselves. So um, those were kind of our big take home points. Um, and with that, we can take any questions. Thank you, Katie and Meredith. Um, again, yeah, I'll open it up to questions. Um, I don't see any coming through the chat box yet. That was fantastic. Really fantastic. Loved everything that you did um, to make it work. Obviously, lots of lessons learned, too. Um, why don't we, oh, we got a question from Casey. Uh, the question from Casey Rogers from SDOT. I uh, was curious to know how much the parklets cost to build. Sure. Um, so let's see. The parklets were about $3,000 a piece in materials. And we use staff time. I haven't actually seen what the staff time related to that was. Uh, so with that, we used our CARES funding. It, this was one of those talking my uh, budget and finance director into uh, <laughs> <laughs> feeling that this was necessary um, to be done during COVID. And so we did use our CARES funds for it. And so total between the four parklets, we spent about $12,000 in materials. I know uh, the city of Everett also uh, helped pay for materials and sounds like Sumner did as well. So that's something that definitely a lot of cities have been doing, that's great. Um, why don't we shift to uh, uh, SDOT and Casey and Elise? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so I'm still on my phone because I was having issues <laughs> with audio. So just um, interrupt me if there's any problems with that. I'm going to go ahead and share our presentation. Okay. Can you see that? Looks great. Thank you. Is it in presentation mode? Not yet. Not yet. No. Okay. Let me try again. I hit the button, but okay. There we go. We Is it still? It was showing the like uh, administrator version of it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, PowerPoint. Very fun. Do you see it now? It's still it's still showing your your notes and I think it's, I yeah I think it's okay. I think it's showing the second screen. If you have two screens up, move to the other screen. Okay, there let me try go. to share it. I'm, oh, we is, have <laughs> was it right? And then I changed it. Let me try again. I'm not used to Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I think if you. How about now? There Perfect. we go. Okay. It might be cut off a little. Well, we'll see. <laughs> white screen. Okay. Yeah. Let me see. On Friday challenges for everyone. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> let me see if I can. Well, just let, is it, how cut off is it, y'all? Uh, you uh, can you go to the next slide? It so? might be a little cut off. Oh dear. Yeah. yeah it might be a little too much. I think it would be fine if we just can view that or um, the other side by side screen. Yeah. yeah. I think we can also. Is this one? Does, yeah, that works. Does this one work? Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for, you know, dealing with my technical issues. <laughs> um, so I'm Elise Nelson. I am currently acting public space manager for the SDOT's public space management group. And Amy Wynn was supposed to join us today, but is sick. So we have Casey Rogers pinch hint hitting for that for us. And he's a program and policy specialist with public space management. So we're really excited to be here today to talk about what we've been up to. And I think that, you know, Brock and Devin both kind of gave you um, a, a good view of what Seattle's doing too. So 
um, hopefully that will we'll just kind of add some details as we go. So we always like to start with our vision, mission, and core values slide for presentations. So I thought is um, committed to, to being a thriving, equitable community powered by dependable transportation. We have six core values, equity, safety, mobility, sustainability, livability, and excellence. And we really see our role as connected to kind of livability and how we can support creating vibrant, active spaces and amenities that support the public's use of the right of way. So our team issues permits, we perform inspections, we develop programs to make sure that, you know, we are also making sure to align with our other values, in particular, how we bring in equity, safety, and mobility. Um, so I will go to the next line here. Um, so today we're going to kind of get some context for where this fits in um, with other efforts in SDOT and then talk about the different phases of our permitting permits and programs that we've developed. Then Casey will talk a little bit about our outreach and evaluation and, and then we can open it up to questions. So Seattle is, at, well SDOT is working to develop a, a plan we're calling RESET recovering with sustainable and equity, equitable transportation. So we're really attempting to understand the how and the who of what how COVID-19 has impacted mobility access in public space. So we're looking to identify strategies that foster recovery and align with our long-term goals and values that I just talked about. So, and how do we prioritize our funding where we've seen the highest impact of, um, of the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, so, you know, we kind of see this as three phases, our, our response, you know, while we're staying at home and, and then our reopening, um, but before we have a vaccine and then recovery after we have a vaccine. And so, you know, we're kind of in the response phase here and the next slide will show you some of what we've done as part of responding to COVID-19. You know, we developed pickup priority zones initially for food pickup. Um, we had over 500 throughout the city. We work to um, our signal operations and to to reduce signal lengths to to help um, limit crowding at intersections. We've developed 27 miles of stay healthy streets where we close streets to through traffic and really encourage people to get out and keep it moving. And we've issued over 150 permits for business recovery, which is what I'll be talking about pri prim primarily today. So to give some background, like um, Devin mentioned, the, you know, the mayor Durkin announced kind of different programs, different phases of work that we've been doing around business recovery. So phase one, we announced the ability to issue permits for sidewalk and curb spaces that help small businesses reopen in phase two of the governor's Stay Healthy Safe Star guidance. And then uh, about a month later, we announced the uh, additional street closure permits being available. Um, so, so we will talk first about the curb space and sidewalk cafe options. So, um, this Safe Start business recovery permitting included dining, display, and vending. Um, so, we had options for sidewalk and curb spaces for all three types of uses. I'm going to turn here to the next slide. So here's some examples of the of sidewalk cafes um, that we saw in the curb space. We um, issued these permits individually to businesses, and initially they were limited to six months, and they were kind of on a rolling um, six month basis. Um, but now we've just recently announced that they've been extended until October 2021. We really work to make our permit process simple and free. Um, so we, we went to council and, and got approval for that. And we've been coordinating internally with our stakeholders to really make sure that we had a streamlined process. Sorry, I lost my mouth here. There we go. Um, so here's just some pictures that kind of highlight what our permit process looked like and, and what we've been doing. So we worked and partnered with our Office of Economic Development group to provide um, in-language access and additional coaching. 
Um, we've also identified priority neighborhoods based on the Office of Planning and Community Development racial equity mapping that helped us focus on where we wanted to do additional outreach, which Casey will talk a little bit more later. So this shows some of the, 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 like the work we did uh, to both translate materials and prepare materials that helped businesses um, know what their options were. Um, we did this equipment PDF that kind of showed some pre-approved options that people, if they wanted us to know an easy route, they could they could use this. We also worked to translate one pagers so businesses could could understand options available to them. And we really seen an unprecedented number of businesses apply for these permits. While our standard sidewalk cafe permits, for example, are often applied for by architects, we've been seeing people business owners themselves applying. So for example, we have an applicant guide online that really walks people through step-by-step step what to do. And um, we decided to not require like really official site plans, but allow people to submit photos or even like a screenshot from a mapping street view type thing where they could show either by like going out and physically chalking up the sidewalk that they want to use or kind of using a computer program to show us what space they wanted to use on the street. So, you know, we've really seen a lot of people be able to submit online applications themselves. So the second phase after um, the mayor's press release on July 22nd was to open it up for street closures as well as the curb space and sidewalk options. And we really um, kind of learned from the first phase and we started by offering coaching sessions and encouraging people to reach out to our team to get coaching up front before they applied so we could kind of sort it out internally and understand what what was possible and if there was any kind of um, big constraints for, for, for moving forward before they spent time and, and submitted an application. And I think that went really well. Um, Casey was one of the, the coaches that we had and then we, we internally were able to kind of troubleshoot um, and I worked to issue most of the permits initially that we did. So here's some examples of our street closures that we did kind of initially. Um, the top right is a um, closure for Optimism Brewing. And then the bottom right is on 11th Avenue. These are both in Capitol Hill. And the bottom left is a Seattle Together Street, which was a program that we implemented where, where SDOT worked more directly with community groups that maybe didn't have the um, the resources to do a street closure on their own. So SDOT kind of provided more technical and logistical support as well as um, providing the, the barricades that they needed in the traffic control devices to set up. And then, and then these were open for more public seating as, as opposed to private restaurant dining. Uh, just this week, we've announced more updates to our program. Um, we've been working hard on this and um, Mayor Durkin and had a press release that announced kind of three things that we're doing now with our street closure permits and, and sidewalk and curb space dining and display. So we have announced winter weather equipment guidelines that people can take advantage of um, and kind of have an easy path where if they follow the guidelines, we don't require, ESTA at least doesn't require any additional review or amendments to the permits they already have in place. Um, we really worked internally with stakeholders from the fire department, the Department of Construction and Inspections, um, the mayor's office to, to have these guidelines up front and um, like kind of vetted by everybody before they went live. So we're excited that hopefully people will have some easy paths to be able to add winter weather equipment without necessitating more SDOT review. Um, but we also recognize that people might want to do their own thing. And so we have kind of identified a path um, for if they want to propose something, how to apply for an amendment to their permit so that we can review something more custom. We've also kind of specced out what options are available for heating um, and, and lighting. And as we've learned along the way, this is really iterative. So we'll continue to probably need to update this as we go and we learn from from um, what what the businesses have in mind because they're very creative. So um, I'm sure it'll change and adapt over time as we have already adapted our program. We also announced with this that we would be allowing the Safe Start permits to continue until next year. 
and um, allowing businesses to keep their equipment in the right of way outside of business hours, um, particularly recognizing that by having more equipment, tents and, and the like, they might have less space on private property to store. Um, there are some exceptions to this, um, one being like if there's a farmer's market, you might need to bring your things in, um, or if you're in a loading zone that's used um, different times of the day, that kind of thing. So here's a map, and I understand at the scale you really can't tell, but this just gives you an overall distribution of Safe Start permits that we've we've issued so far. So we've issued over 150. That includes 12 temporary street closure permits. Um, we also have the four SDOT supported Seattle Together street closures, and the rest are divided between merchandise display, outdoor dining, and temporary vending. Although I'd say the majority have been for outdoor dining use. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Casey Rogers to tell us more about what we've been hearing. Thanks, Elise. Um, so as you can see on this slide, I've extracted some quotes and some um, clips from the media, but we have been hearing, I would say, overall pretty positive feedback. Um, in addition to getting a, quite a bit of press. Uh, I think Eater has featured our programs a number of times, um, South Seattle Emerald, Seattle Times. Um, and I think it's notable that um, the media has also really helped us promote the programs. Um, I will acknowledge that it hasn't all been positive feedback um, as, uh, as things go in the planning world, but um, I would say generally speaking, um, we've really heard good things. Um, Elise, wanna to go to the next slide? So, you know, with outreach and promoting these programs, you know, we understand that in the past, yeah, the neighborhoods and the um, uh, communities that we've seen engage with our programs have been in kind of the traditionally more resourced parts of the city. So, you know, as such, we really wanted to set out to do more direct outreach in those communities that haven't participated in the past and are also, um, more likely to have been hit by COVID. Um, so we took, this map here shows um, some OPCD data. Um, we created this framework to, to use for actual, for our outreach. The blue, very high level represents more kind of resourced neighborhoods. Um, and the, I guess, more red kind of brownish colors are kind of the opposite. So we, you know, did traditional program outreach, but then kind of these uh, bullet points show the other tools that we did. So we, we to reach out to the other communities. So we collaborated with Office of Economic Development. Um, they have a small business advocate team and an only in Seattle team that has really worked in neighborhoods like Rainier Beach, South Park. And so we worked with uh, OED staff to then connect us to those neighborhoods or even just work with OED staff themselves who worked with those neighborhoods and kind of represented SDOT's programs. Um, as Elise, Elise mentioned, we did a lot of individualized coaching, um, set up 30, 45 minute phone calls to do one-on-one -on -one kind of intake sessions with people interested in our programs. Um, and then some folks on our team actually did in-person door-to-door -door outreach um, in those priority neighborhoods, Central District, Beacon Hill, um, to help kind of promote the programs in those neighborhoods. And then individual phone calls. So kind of leveraging our past connections, um, talking with our partners around the city, trying to find good entry points into those kind of priority neighborhoods. Um, and you know, at least showed the map of where the business recovery permits kind of are currently in the city. And, you know, while we're really trying to um, see more engagement in these equity areas, I think uh, we do still have a lot of ways to go. But with that, at least you want to advance to the next slide. So we are in the process of doing a program evaluation, which will continue as the program continues. And the real goal with this is to be able to tweak and modify the program based on feedback. Um, and the evaluation is split into two parts. So there's an implementation evaluation and then an outcome evaluation. And I would say, you know, high level, what we've heard so far is that the kind of proactive customer service, the coaching and the direct technical assistance 
has been really helpful for folks. Um, and, you know, just us spending that extra time to walk people through the kind of wealth of information that we have and perhaps at times overwhelming guidance materials. Um, so people have really been appreciative of that. But there have been a few barriers to participation. So, um, you know, we, we have those translated guidance materials. We've worked with our language access line to do interpretation and translation. Um, but at the end of the day, getting a permit um, is through our online customer service portal, which is only in English. So um, we've seen some, some challenges within particularly our uh, vending permit holders, which is predominantly um, not native English speakers, um, BIPOC uh, immigrant owned businesses. So we do have a little ways to go there, but um, uh, we are working on it and we're excited to kind of continue with this and, and get more feedback as we go. I think with that, we can, oh, that's the end. <laughs> no, that was a lot. Do people have questions or? I'll just say, uh, Elise, Casey, I've been totally impressed by your work over the summer to build up the program and launch it and work with the hundreds of, of businesses, I mean, not all of which have applied and gone through the whole process, but um, it's been great to see. And I know we all would have liked to see like these things happen more quickly. Um, but it, it's great to, to have them now. Yeah. Well, thanks. Again, I'll uh, just pause and see if anyone um, is typing in any questions in the chat box. Um, if not, I think we are about ready to move to our breakout um, session. Oh, Devin has a question coming. Devin, do you want to? Um, I can just let you ask a question yourself if you like. Thank you. Yeah, Elise and Casey, uh, thank, uh, I just went through and had the opportunity to look through the document that ESTAT just put out with regards to the new winterize provisions. Mm -hmm. um, so it looks like obviously open flame propane heat, you'd have to get an SP, uh, fire department uh, permit for that, but you can't put it under any structure. The electric permit, the electric heaters can be placed under structures. However, it does say that you can't use extension cords to, to plug them in. So my question is how, how best can folks heat their street cafes if they can't use an extension cord for the electric heater, but they can't use the propane heater either? <laughs> yeah, it's um, kind of a conundrum, I guess. I think I think that we need to have like a bling, bring your own blanket campaign. I think we, we might need to encourage people to, you know, kind of bundle up and think about this as like their like ski vacation. I, I think that, um, you know, there might be possibilities if people have outdoor outlets on their buildings, we are allowing, um, you know, the cord to cross the sidewalk with appropriate ramping. So, I mean, I, but I do think we're going to have to just get creative and maybe choose one or the other, honestly. Thank you. A question from Ryan Windish. Um, has there been any individual outreach to businesses, especially um, BIPOC businesses? Yeah. Um, yes. The answer is yes. And the answer is we're trying to do more. Um, we've been, we've, you know, tried to be creative on how to um, really emphasize um, BIPOC-owned um, businesses. We've leveraged our connections across the city, working particularly with Office of Economic Development, um, who has a lot of connections to folks um, in more under-resourced neighborhoods. Um, we've done some door-to-door -door outreach, as I mentioned, um, individual phone calls. Um, so we're really, um, trying to do that kind of one-on-one, -on -one, but we're also sensitive to trying not to overload the community with outreach and touch points. And so trying to be strategic in how, you know, maybe the uh, Department of Neighborhoods already has connections or already has meetings with certain folks. So piggybacking onto those kinds of um, existing outreach efforts. Does that answer your question, uh, Ryan? Yeah, thank you. That's great. Sure. Great. And, um... Uh, we now have a link to that SDOT winter guidance in the chat. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to check that out. Thank you, Devin, for linking that there. Um, then Meredith Neal with Puyallup um, 
loves the bring your bring your own blanket campaign. So maybe we have something going there. Yeah. Um, great. So we have about 20 minutes left. So I think it's time for us to move into the breakout sessions. So we have three breakout rooms. Um, they will be moderated by um, Brock Howell, Richard Gelb, and Elise Nelson. So we have some experts to guide us through some of these conversations here. Um, before we break off, Brock or Richard, I don't know if there's anything you want to add um, for folks to keep in mind. Great. All right. Well, um, Michaela, I think we are ready to move into our breakouts. All right, I think we have everyone back here. Um, as we near 12 o'clock, I just wanna start off by saying thank you to everyone for attending. Um, I thought this was a fantastic program today. Um, really enjoyed hearing about the Streets Guide um, as well as what's happening on the ground in Seattle and Puyallup. Um, I think they provide a lot of interesting lessons and um, a roadmap for us as we figure out how to do this in the winter and make this perhaps a more permanent um, feature of our cities. So um, just, some, just some thoughts before we wrap up. Um, the recording of the presentations will be made available. Unfortunately, the breakouts were not recorded, but we will um, post the notes from those conversations um, to our website and we'll email both the recording and those notes out to you. Um, again, this is the last peer networking of the year. So uh, if you made it through, we had three events this year. If you made it through all three, I just want to say thank you. Um, obviously, we've hit some uh, <laughs> some uh, hurdles, and you know we don't we can't do these in person um, at the moment. Um, but for next year, we'll be putting together a, a slate of events and. Um, Everyone who attended this will be on the peer networking listserv. So stay tuned for more information on that. If you have ideas for topics or things for us to discuss, um, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is ben or bcon at psrc. That's b k a h n at psrc.org. Um, and with that, I will let everyone go. Thank you and have a great weekend. <laughs>